This is an action research oriented network. It is both a, a lab and a, a meeting space and an actual network of organizations um, in which Michelle and others study networks of organizations. So there's meta, meta everything going on here. But uh, Michelle has been doing this for a long time. I'll let her explain how long. What I am most impressed by in the work of the Network for Nonprofit Social Impact is how um, very focused uh, Michelle and her colleagues have been on um, studying and um, engaging, intervening to help organizations in multiple sectors work together better to address the wicked problems that um, our society faces in so many different realms. So Michelle's work is absolutely foundational to much of mine. It's also been pioneering over many decades and it intersects with work in organizational studies from a broad array of disciplines, as well as from a lens of com constitutive communication and network analyses. Michelle brings many different methods to bear in her work, and she has studied networks of impact in a variety of different issue areas. It happens that today she's presenting to us um, work on a network impact in the arena of education and education outcomes. And so that's why this is a particular interest to Maya Young, who I already called out as a PhD candidate in the College of Ed, very interested in interorganizational collaboration, multi-sector collaboration around education outcomes. But this question of how to get organizations, different kinds of sectors of organizations to work together on um, issues that are thorny, that are complex, that are uh, historically laden with many, many complications. These are the questions that Michelle centers her time and expertise in. So I'm delighted to be introducing you today, Michelle. There's much more to learn about her, um, but let's start with that as an intro and say welcome. And we're really glad that you would join us for this time today. Oh, that was such a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I, I guess I have been doing this work a, a while, so I have to get used to people being able to say I've been doing this for decades. I'm not quite sure I'm ready for that, but um, I'm going to hang in where with that that for t and kind of own it for today. Um, okay, so let me now that Zoom is doing its funny thing, let me move this over here. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is network, um, interorganizational network designs that improve educational outcomes. And really in this talk, I have three goals. I want you to walk away knowing um, what is a network for social impact? What makes it a network? How do you understand it? What's the kind of the boundary areas for that? I want you to understand some key decisions um, in the design of networks for social impact. What are some of the things we have to think about? What are some of the different ways they could be designed? And then finally, I'm gonna conclude with uh, talking about our research, um, particularly in education that we spent some time on, um, moving about moving the needle on educational outcomes and what that looks like. So that's our agenda. I'm hoping if those three things um, are where we're, we're heading. Um, so much of the talk for today comes from two works. Um, so I, I put them up front so I don't have to cite them a lot later. Um, and so that I can tell you about my wonderful colleagues. Um, so one of them is a book that I had come out last year. I was co-authored with Catherine Cooper, um, who was for a while my doctoral student, graduated, became my postdoc, and is now a professor um, at DePaul and is a wonderful person and off, often my um, process brain. <laughs> That's why I like to think of her. It's wonderful to have really long-standing collaborations. And then um, the second th piece of this is actually a piece that just got accepted at the Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory. Um, I often publish research um, now um, outside of the field of communication, occasionally inside the field of communication, but I tend to go to where the conversation is and the place that this particular conversation is around network effectiveness is happening primarily in public administration. Um, and so I, that's where I'm going to talk about that this work is um, a co authored work with Sean Daughtry. Um, Sean is an um, educational economist by training, um, and he is currently at Boston University and does that kind of work, um, and he has been a wonderful collaborator in this. I could not have done um, many of the things that we did in this work without him. 
And then um, Josh Miles and Anne Marie Boyer are both, um, well, one current and one recently graduated um, PhD student from the lab. Josh is now at Marquette University. And then Rong Wang, um, and you've recognized Catherine Cooper. Um, Rong Wang was a postdoc um, in the lab when a lot of this work was done and is now in um, at Vanderbilt and so doing work there. All of these are wonderful collaborators. And so that's one of the best things about this part in my career and my life is I get to work with wonderful people and do really um, work that I'm passionate about. And so um, I just give you that as a context that um, although I'm gonna talk about the work today, there's a lot of other people who contributed to it. So my three questions. Number one, what are networks for social impact? So when I say network, here's what I mean. I mean a group of three or more organizations working together in a way that balances autonomy and interdependence. They have to maintain a level of autonomy, meaning that there are separate organizations still there. We are not merging, right? But they don't just work independently. That would be a market, right? That's the way that markets generally work. There is a degree of interdependence. And that interdependence has been described in a lot of different ways, um, and we're going to talk about some of those design features in a moment. Um, but depending on which subdiscipline you're in, that has, sometimes these things are described as cross-sector social partnerships, or multi-stakeholder partnerships, or collaboration, or public-private networks, or collective impact, or coalitions, or finally networks. I'm going to use networks for all of that because I find it's a good leveling playing field, and that allows me to then talk about different design features. So I've got network. What do we mean? Um, by social impact. Oh, something is not showing up. Hold on for just a second. Aha, it went to a different place. There we go. Fixing that. There we go. So what do we mean by social impact? Social impact should be the outcome of the network. So by social impact, I don't mean organizational impact, although that's important. So organizational impact are when organizations participate in these interdependent relationships, they get benefits. They might learn things, they might increase their prestige, they might get new resources. In fact, there's some nice research that says they survive better when they're in these kinds of relationships. Those are all good, that's not social impact for me. Social impact is also not network level impact for me. So network level impact are outcomes that are experienced by the partnership or by the network itself. So like um, we are able to raise more money together, right? Because we are a network, that's great. Or I can, um, there are new relationships between partner organizations or the number of members in our network continues to grow. All good indicators that good stuff's happening, not social impact for me. Social impact for me is when outcomes are experienced by a community as a result of the network's activity and the scale of that might change the type of that impact might be different how innovative it might be is different the approach whether that's more prevention or remediation might be different but it's all at the community level um, so some of the networks that we've studied have looked at things like which i'm going to talk about today improved educational outcomes for youth but also might include things like a reduction in seniors emergency room visits um, when we think about um, particularly networks that address the social determinants of health and aging, um, or they might be networks that we've studied that come together to make a policy change. And so, for example, um, in the Midwest, I've been a big fan of the REAMP network for years who have um, effectively stopped the building of coal power plants in the Midwest through their network action, right? So there are all sorts of possibilities here on what that means but it happens at the community level. So we've covered what is a network, and we've covered what is a social impact. Now we're ready to pick on our second question, which is, well, okay, you've told me what networks are, you've told me what they try to do, right? Like you're interested in the social impact they've achieved. How are they designed? What are the key features that differentiate networks from one to another? And there's a whole bunch of them. I'm gonna give you a few and then I'm going to highlight um, one in particular that I think is particularly important. So the first one is organizational composition. 
Organizational composition refers to two things. How many different sectors are represented? Sometimes when I study networks, they're all nonprofits, or they're all government entities, or they're all in a very particular sub area. And so you can have a kind of um, a, a network that is a little bit, has a little more homophily when it comes to type. Or you can see really interesting cross-sector social partnerships where you have the public health department, the mayor's office, um, a bunch of nonprofits across the city, faith-based organizations also participating. And those differences in composition make a difference. Second design feature that makes a difference is the number of organizations that participate. Remember that the minimum is three, but I've seen networks of hundreds of organizations working together on the high end. And the number of organizations participating has all sorts of design implications. The larger the number of organizations that are participating, the more likely you are to centralize governance, the more likely you are to have working groups, the more likely you have to structure activities more formally. So that's one of the design features you have to contend with. Third one is relationship types. There's all sorts of different relationships that organizations can form with one another. Um, sometimes we study collaborative relationships. Sometimes it's contracting relationships. Sometimes it's learning relationships. So there's all sorts of different types. Um, network governance is probably the best and most studied in public administration kind of features, design feature that people look at. And that is usually three different kinds of governance they look at. One is what's called distributed governance. And what that means is that everybody decides together. I love being a part of everybody decides together. I, this, th those are lovely little collaboratives. I was with one actually on Sunday in New York, and there was a group of, of eight of us sitting around, all representing different organizations, and I was facilitating. And how did we decide what we're going to do? Everyone had to agree. <laughs> That's how we decided, right? Like that was one form of governance. Um, it's sometimes slower, right? And it can lead to some conflict, but it, it's one of the ways that people make decisions. Sometimes people make decisions because they are through what we call a lead organization, which means one organization in the network steps up and it becomes the manager of the network making most of the decisions. And that's a way that happens. And then a third possibility that shows up, it's what's called a network administrative organization. And a network administrative organization is a separate entity that's formed for the purpose of governing the network. And as networks grow increasingly large, it's more and more likely that they will actually form a separate entity. Sometimes it's a government entity or a fiscally sponsored entity or its own 501c3 nonprofit entity that is formed for the purpose of governing the network. Um, networks vary in terms of their longevity. Um, sometimes networks come and go very quickly. Um, I've been with networks that have been around 25, 30, 40 years, um, also working uh, for the long term of what they're doing. The one that, thing that I want to draw your attention to, because it's something that we come out and talk about um, for the, probably for the first time um, in the in our work that's separate from what others have previously done, is around theory of change. And this is one of the design features that I think makes a difference. And a theory of change basically says, how does a network's activity make a social impact? What's the product of all of that structure? And so I'm going to talk about three of the five because I don't have time to talk about all five and still get through the study. But I'm going to give you a flavor for what this looks like. Um, one of the most common ones that people are familiar with of how networks make a social impact is through project social impact, which is the creation and delivery of a new program product. Um, it's based upon joint input leads to joint output for the network. That's the idea behind it. So let me give you an example. Um, so one of the networks we worked with was the Chattanooga Museums Collaborative in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, this is a group of three museums in Chattanooga. Um, and when they first started working together, they were not after making a social impact. They were what we call a back office cooperative, which means they were sharing things that like purchasing, bulk purchasing and IT support. And um, they were doing payroll together so they all didn't have to pay separate payroll offices. That's how they started. Um, but in the time, the mayor of Chattanooga, who was Bob Corker, fun fact, um, ended up um, approaching them and saying, you know, we need to make Chattanooga a destination um, and let's revitalize the waterfront 
in order to make it a place where people want to come. It's going to be good for the museums. It'll be good for Chattanooga, win-win. How about you guys raise money together as a capital campaign for this? And they did. Um, they were, um, came together and they did the 21st century waterfront ca um, campaign. Um, they made a deal with one another that they would not allow um, donors to earmark any funds for any particular museum. It all had to go into one pot. And then the Chattanooga matched the, um, the, the money that they raised, the city did. And so they raised about $100 million. And then the city put in another $100 million to make um, what you see in front of you in this picture, which is the beautiful waterfront of Chattanooga and the way that they revitalized it and put it together. What's their social impact? The social impact is on the quality of the outcome of the project, right? So it's not all the activity that matters as much as they've created a beautiful revitalized waterfront, the people who come to enjoy it, the economic development that results as a part of it, that's the impact of their um, collaboration on that project. So second, second theory of, uh, of you know, social uh, impact that we're gonna talk about, theory of change is learning. And learning theories of change are different. They're not creating a new program or a service Instead, what these networks are trying to do is improve the quality of the services that organizations already offer, right? So they wanna make existing programs and services better. So let me give you a, an example of what that looks like. Um, so the Chicago Benchmarking Collaborative is here um, and they are all early childhood and adult um, education providers. They do this two, two gen kind of thing, early childhood and adult education. And the idea of that early childhood and adult education programs um, when they got together was not that they were going to collaborate in any way. They share none of the same clients. You should know this, they're in totally different parts of the city, right? Um, but what they did share is the same data system for gathering educational outcome data. So they identified, what does it mean to be ready for kindergarten? What are our measures that we're going to commonly use to assess early childhood literacy? How are we going to measure employment success for, uh, for adult learners? And they got, all agreed on the measures. So everything was the exact same measure across, in this case, um, six plus a lead agency um, organizations. And the way that their collaborative works is they get together and they look at the shared data report and they benchmark against each other. Who is doing the best at um, helping students improve their um, readiness for, for kindergarten when it comes to literacy, early literacy, for example? And they will look around the room and realize, I thought it was doing pretty good, but you know, we're the last when it comes to everybody else. What are you all doing? Right? And they share ideas about what that is. And then each organization makes a plan. And that plan, they identify what's the thing that they're improving. What are they going to do over the course of the year to improve that metric? And what's at least one practice they heard from another organization in the collaborative they're going to try? And then they follow up and they check in at the mid-year and they check in at the end of the year and see how it's going. And what's the result? They all get better at what they're doing, right? The improvement in the quality of the outcomes for children and for the adult learners who are part of their programs is their social impact and they have they have significantly improved those metrics over time as a result of their efforts. Last one I want to talk about is systems alignment and systems alignment is where you coordinate services um, to explore gaps in services and you figure out where earlier gains are lost. Um, so I'm going to tell you two stories in order to illustrate what systems alignment is. Um, the first one is actually another one here in Chicago, and I love to tell this story. It's one of my favorites um, because it's just very relatable. So a bunch of, um, in this case, um, literacy organizations were sitting around, as you do, and starting to talk shop because the speaker for their shared meeting was late. They were stuck in traffic. They had extra time. So they were sitting around talking shop, and somebody said, I am having the worst trouble with the principal of Schiller Elementary School. He is, he won't call me back. I've emailed, I've called. Nobody is, he's just not responding to me. I'm so frustrated. And somebody behind them said, you know what? I'm having the same problem with him. And another literacy organization perked up and said, me too. 
pretty soon they started getting wise after the fourth or fifth person and they ask how many of us have a early I have a literacy program at Schiller Elementary School. And 19 organizations hands went up. When they ended up doing in Chicago mapping out where the literacy programs were they found that there were places like Schiller and elementary where they had clumped up where there were lots of folks offering more than they needed to for a particular elementary school no wonder the principal wasn't getting back to them with 19 there right um, but there are other places in Chicago where there were no literacy programs so systems alignment in part is about distributing those programs better trying to identify places where there's not anybody being served, where there is and where there's an oversaturation of services. The second place where this shows up is kind of a continuation of that, which is when you think about trying to figure out how to make coordinate services, part of it is a distribution, but part of it is also a continuum. Um, so this is the um, kindergarten through 12th grade continuum that um, Summit Education Initiative uses in, and they're in, located in Akron, Ohio, and they're a collective impact cradle to career network. The idea here is that um, sometimes earlier gains that you make in kindergarten can get lost as you transition between different parts of programs. And so the trick is to get programs to align with one another. Um, in Summit, they actually began to do this um, much earlier than kindergarten. They began to do this in preschool. And so I'm going to tell you kind of what they did there. One of the things that they did is they got all of their um, elementary schools to agree to use the same kindergarten readiness assessment. And then they worked with all of the preschools in the area to identify which students were coming from what preschools which allowed them to identify what preschools were producing students that weren't quite ready yet. Which then allowed them to do education in those preschools with those preschool teachers to bring them up to um, greater professional development so that more students would be ready for, kind for kindergarten. And it also allowed them to identify those students. They moved the kindergarten readiness assessment back from the fall when they started kindergarten to the spring while they were still in preschool. Just moved it, right? What did that allow them to do? To figure, identify which students were not ready for kindergarten yet and offer a summer bridge program so that they could be ready by the time they got to kindergarten and they could figure out where they were coming from before even then. That's systems alignment. It's not changing anybody's programs. It's just changing how they coordinate those programs through each other. So I've now onto my third question here. My third question is what design features are associated with greater network effectiveness? So we've talked about what it is. We've talked about some of the key, key design features. Third one is okay, you can design these a bunch of ways. Which ones are most effective? Um, in the book, we talk about two key axioms. There's five, but I'm gonna tell, tell you about two um, that I think are important in answering this question. Um, the first one is that networks are sensitive to their environment and that's important because if we were to say apples to apples and comparing networks and assuming that all communities are the same um, we would be doing ourselves a disservice some networks have a harder job because their communities are at a different starting point right and the resources that are in that community make a difference um, the challenges in history of that community make a difference. Networks do not operate in a vacuum. Those things still matter. The second point that we make in the book and that I'm gonna illustrate here in, in this particular study is that there's more than one path to social impact. So I'm not going to give you at the end of this, like this is the one way all networks ought to look because I don't believe that. And in fact, our research doesn't bear that out. There are some um, multiple paths that will get you to social impact. However, there are also some dead ends, right? So it's not to say they're all good, but there's more than one that are good. So what did we do? Um, this is part of a study that was funded by the Army Research Office, uh, which is a basic uh, research um, kind of um, funding center. And we studied 26 education, cross-sector education networks. Um, you can kind of see where they are on the map there. Um, we originally were after looking at collective impact versus not collective impact networks. 
Um, and so the study design um, you know, utilizes what's called a propensity matching score, where we match communities. We identified first a collective impact, and then we identified another community in the same state that had generally the same demographic size, all of those things. And then we solicited a network from that community to also participate. That process took a while. I'll be happy to describe that in some detail if you'd like later. Um, but we ended up with 26 or 13 match pairs. The mean size of the networks was 36 organizations. So that gives you a sense of where we're at. Um, but they range from between eight organizations to 121 organizations. Um, in total, our sample is 920 organizations embedded in those 26 networks. They serve about 1.3 million students in total. Um, and we were with these networks for two years. Plan was three years, COVID made it two. Um, and so uh, we surveyed all the organizations in the network. Um, we did interviews with all of the network leaders two years apart. And then we collected a whole bunch of archival education data from across the United States and through the census about these communities. Um, this research uses, and I'm going to sweep by this pretty fast, but I'm just for the grad students in the room. I don't want you to think there is no theoretical framework. There is a theoretical framework. If this sounds interesting to you and you want to know more about people who look at network design features and then try to figure out how it relates to effectiveness, these people are called, use something called the configurational approach. Um, and the, the key idea is that there are combinations of factors, not just one factor that ultimately leads to effectiveness. Um, happy to talk more about the configurational approach and other approaches later, but not the central research question that I said I was going to explain in the talk. What I did say I was going to talk about was network effectiveness, and I think that there's two key assumptions that we make in this study that maybe push the boundaries a little. One is for a network to be effective in our research, they have to be more effective than if the network did not exist. Right. And so how do you measure that? Well, you compare it to trend lines to see if, in fact, we're seeing a change in these communities that depart from the general trend in their state. Right. But the second thing also is true, which is that what's successful for one community might not be successful for the other, meaning that we've got to control for some contextual factors. Um, so schools for districts, for example, who have a high percentage of free and reduced lunch, which is our measure of childhood poverty um, and it's sometimes additional resources needed. Um, are going to have a harder time moving their needle than some of the others are. And so we have to account for demographic differences in schools. So what do we do? To get to network effectiveness, we didn't just collect the district data in the 95 school districts that were associated with our 26 networks. We also collected it for every school district in the state that they were located in. Um, so you can see that was like 76 in Florida and 1,021 in Michigan. We collected these for all dates that we could possibly collect them. And the reason why is that we used uh, what's called either an interrupted time series or in, in two cases, and if you want to talk about why later of those two cases, um, a non-parametric difference in difference design to account for uh, the trend line in state. Um, and we were predicting, we had ran models for three different metrics. One of them is fourth grade reading, eighth, the second is eighth grade reading, and the third one is high school graduation. All right. uh, and we, all of our models include percentage of free and reduced lunch, percentage of students who identify as Black Hispanic, which is historically a predictor due to race, uh, student outcomes due to racial inequity. Um, then we used, we looked at their residual scores, and we're able to look and to see how effective they were. Now, for those of you who are first few students who I just gave a whole bunch of math to, let me tell you this in a picture, <laughs> right, because I think that that might be good. So this is an example of a model that we fitted for Iowa for eighth grade English language arts. And here on the, the orange line that you see right here, that's the kind of um, predictive line for the state, right, for all of Iowa. And you can see there's like a whole bunch of gray dots here. These are the other school districts, right? Like this is kind of like the, their distribution of that fitted value. The um, little maroon, let's go with marooned um, um, pieces here, these little diamonds here, that's one of the networks that we looked at. They're not very different than the state trend line, right? They're kind of the same as everybody else. Not an effective network in this case. But if you look up here at the little plus signs, this is another one of the networks we studied. 
their residual scores are way above trend line, right? Like they are set it, they are separated out. Their fitted values are way above what you would expect. That's a successful network for us, right? So that's the way that we're thinking about this. Um, all of that leads us to the second thing, methody thing I get to teach you a little bit about today. Um, and that is qualitative comparative analysis. So I'm a mixed method scholar. Qualitative comparative analysis is one of those fun methods that you can use if you have lots of different kinds of data about folks. And it works really good well for um, between 15 and 50 cases. That's like the perfect place for QCA. It's got a few features that are fun. One of them is equifinality, which means it allows for multiple paths to success, which works really well given some of our axioms that we think there are multiple paths to success. Second thing is fun about it is it uses um, conjectural causation, which is like Boolean logic and set theory. So if you have ever done a Google search, this is particularly for the students, if you've ever done a Google search and you've used and or, you kind of get the way that variables go together in quali compar um, qualitative comparative analysis. Um, one last piece of this that I'm going to talk about is asymmetrical relations. So in like in a regression, if I was to do a standard regression, um, you know, you assume that if I see a score and it's present there, that the absence of it means if the negative case were true, it wouldn't be there, right? Like these things are the same. Um, in QCA, it doesn't assume, assume that. The solution for a negative set, meaning not in set or the thing not being there, and the solution for the positive set are not just the inverse of each other. They can be unique ways. So a kind of an easy way to talk about that is the way to succeed is not necessarily the uh, opposite of the way to fail. Right, like those things don't have to be related in that way. Um, what that means when you do QCA fun um, is that you create something called a, a truth table. And a truth table means that you go through each of your variables and you identify, um, doesn't have to be a one and a zero, I'm using that in this, in this case, but you identify how you're going to make meaningful differences for each of your variables. So it's not a matter of just plugging in the data. You still are very much qualitatively looking at your cases, figuring out what calibration would make sense. How do you understand this? Is this a good value, but this is not good value? That's why it's a qualitative method. So in network effectiveness, what that meant is that we had to make some choices about how we would calibrate. First thing to know about calibration is that you have to look at what success looks like in the distribution of your cases, right? You need that as part of it. In this case, only eight of our 26 networks were effective using our standard. So it's a that's pretty small set that we're talking about overall. And we use some metrics to try to determine how many metrics they had that were of uh, a, a particular um, magnitude. Um, it was what held, allowed us to determine what was in set and what was out of set. Um, we also looked at re resource munificence, which is a measure of community poverty, and we basically split the, the networks in two. If the community poverty rate was a below the official 2016 rate, which is where um, kind of we had a, a good starting point, we used, um, they were basically um, not resource munificent. If it was above that uh, rate, they were resource munificent. Um, we did network size as a, what's called a fuzzy set, which means we allowed it to vary, but the crossover point was 30. And for network governance, we included centralized governance as one and decentralized governance as our other category because we did not find that the lead versus NAO was a meaningful difference in this case. Um, when we started to dig into those interviews, we had some organizations who were much more dependent on group decision making, even though they were the official leader of the organization. And so we ended up separating them out into these two groups. Um, we looked at three types, three theories of change, which are the three I've already introduced to you. Um, we were, would have been happy to see policy and catalyst. It didn't, didn't show up in our sample. So like this wasn't a, a particular decision. It was just what was the artifact of the collection we had. Um, and based upon the interviews and archival data, we looked for those who were doing project-based theory of change. In this case, those who were doing project-based theory of change didn't do any of the other two, so they were very cleanly separated from them. Um, those who were doing the learning theory of change sometimes also participated in uh, a, used a systems alignment theory of change. So those were sometimes combined, but not always. And so you should know that they can do 
they could have done all three, like that coding would have allowed it. But in our case, they either did project learning systems or learning and systems combined. Those were the, the groups that we saw. Um, so this is the kind of way that solutions look when you get out them out of QCA. I will explain a little bit here, and then I'm going to give you lots of words to kind of explain this. But I wanted for those of you who are interested in this method and intrigued by it for you to at least see what the results typically look like. Um, here you'll see we have three solutions. So in regression, you would get one solution. In QCA, you get lots of solutions, right? And your solutions, if you have a... Um, um, if you have a circle here, it means absence of. If you have a little circle with an X, it means the presence of. Yes, the presence of. Um, and then you have the cases here. These are our case numbers. So cases go into particular solutions. You'll get measures of consistency and coverage. Consistency means how many of the cases that have these conditions are also not in the negative case, right? Like how consistent is this finding? It's kind of the measure of which these hang together. Coverage is what percentage of these cases does this account for, right? So you can see this number for coverage is higher when we have three cases, it's lower when we have two, it's even lower when we have one. That's what that means. Um, anything consistency is less than 0.8 is considered not good enough um, for QCA. We had two cases that fall into, fell into an alternative solution, but they were not as consistent. And so this particular solution only explains six of our eight successful cases. So what did these solutions mean? Um, so solution number one, you can see the formula. So greater resource munificence, decentralized network governance, and using a project theory of change. That's our formula here. Um, we're going to call those the self-organized program network which is slightly fewer words, but self-organized programs are, are pretty good. Um, I'm going to give you an example and tell you in words now what this means. So the Grinnell campaign for grade level reading is a great example of this network design. Their mission, um, as are all campaign for grade level reading networks, are around improving third grade uh, reading. But Grinnell, if you ever calc uh, if you type into Google um, Grinnell, uh, Iowa, you will see that it is um, a pretty small town. And in the center is Grinnell College, lovely university, um, leader of this network, right? And, but they, they are doing this with um, little money and um, there's not a lot to coordinate. So what they instead did was create a whole bunch of different new programs. Um, and the way those new programs came up is they graded working groups. Um, so each working group kind of owned an area. One was after school enrichment, one was healthy readers, another one was summer learning. They worked together and they created new programs for each of those areas and different partner organizations owned them. Students, no matter where they came from, could go into those programs. There was no barrier to doing that. Um, and since they were founded, their outcomes on all three examined metrics have improved above the predicted values in their state. In fact, that picture I showed you of Iowa with the little pluses on the top, those little pluses represent Grinnell. And it looks the same if we're doing fourth grade, eighth grade, or high school graduation. They, are, they have really moved the needle using a program theory of change. Second the pathway to success here, um, lower network size, greater resource munificence, learning theory of change, and systems alignment theory of change combined. Right, so this is the conjunction piece. Um, an example of that is the Hartford Partnership for Student Success, and it's a network of 20 organizations. It serves about 20,000 students. Um, it um, really has leaned into learning by um, evaluation. And so the idea of learning by evaluation means that they are collect using standard metrics and they're providing technical assistance to help everybody use those metrics. And then they have tried to do basically continuous quality improvement to figure out ways to improve those metrics in areas they've identified. Um, to make the systems alignments um, work, they use something called the community schools approach. And they, if you've ever encountered the community schools approach, if uh, the idea is that you bring all the social services that students need into the school. So if they need eye care um, or a vision exam, that happens in school. If they need dental care, that can happen in school. If you need food, that can happen in school. If you need um, counseling, mental health counseling, that can happen in school. This becomes a center where everything happens. And then that's coordinated in a team-based approach around a student and their family. 
So the, the needs are identified and then co-occurring needs are identified and services are provided. So um, the Harvard Partnership for Student Success um, has two of the three examined outcomes have improved above the predicted state values. And they've done it in this unique way of combining learning and systems alignment um, in the case of a lower network size. Last of our, our three pathways, and this only if you remember from the figure had um, that table only had one organization in it, um, is what we call the informal leader. And we kept it even though we only had one case because it was the only case in our sample who had less resource munificent. This is important because 13 of our 26 networks, if you recall, were above below the poverty line. It was very, very rare for a community who was above that below that median poverty line to be able to become an effective network. This is the only example that we can explain where they did. Um, so this is um, a network that is in Wilmington, North Carolina. This is a now called Voyage. It was first started as the Blue Ribbon Commission to End Youth Violence. And that's kind of their story is they began first as a violence prevention um, program modeled after the Harlem Children's Zone. Um, the network has 36 member organizations. Um, they have a backbone organization, but this is one of those places where that was less important that they had a network administrative backbone organization. Because if you talk to them, they will say, we have no decision making a power because we've given it all away to the community. And that turns out to actually be true in this case because they have community councils and they have committees for each of their area and a youth advisory board. And those places determine their programming and they just do what they say. <laughs> that's, that's their model of, of handling that, which has meant that they do things like um, they have barbecues and they um, they end up supporting new programs that the community identifies and the youth identify. But they've also taken a data driven approach. Um, this is a network who really like they will the leader of this network will talk to your ear off about the social ecological model and risk and protective factors for families and have taught all of the community based organizations in their network, this model and these protective factors and they've all incorporated into their work. Um, so this has been a really a chance for them to learn and grow. Um, they uh, had seen a significant improvement in one of the two metrics available. High school graduation is not available at, at, at a routine level in North Carolina for an interesting set of reasons. And so um, that became only the thing that we were able to do with them. So big picture conclusions and I'm wrapping it up. One, most networks for social impact that we studied did not make us greater social impact, right? They are no different than state lines. Eight out of 26 isn't very good odds, right? Second, theories of social change seem to make a difference in understanding which networks make a social impact. There are times in which project makes sense. Our hunch is that that's when you're talking about smaller communities. So in almost all of the cases that we have in that recipe, we're talking about small rural communities where you can actually get your hands around almost every kid in the community. Project is a great idea for there. But in some of the large urban areas, what we, we find, at least in resource munificence communities, is that learning and systems alignment seems to work better. Um, third, resource munificence is defining. It is very, very hard for a network to move the needle on educational outcomes in a community with higher community poverty. It's just not something that showed up in our networks. And then finally, there's multiple pathways to social impact. There's not just one, right? And so there's multiple ways that these design features come together. So that gives me my three questions, right? So we've identified what is a network? What is social impact? We've taken a look at some of the design features and hopefully you've begun to see the ways that making choices and combining those design features are more or less likely to result in a social impact for some networks. So I'm ready to take questions, comments. I can talk about any of this or anything else you wanna know about um, networks for social impact. I'm open. Thank you so much. Um, could you stop sharing your screen so we can yes. see and I can see who's wanting to ask questions? All right. Wow, there's a lot here. It's really exciting work. I highly recommend the book, everyone. It's really, really a good read. Um, but this really helps us deeper dive into this particular um, case as well. So who, who would like to start with questions? Yeah, Katie. 
Hey, Michelle, great talk and great seeing you. Um, you know, I'm listening to all this and when I read your work, it's just incredible to me that you are somehow have the time to be managing these huge projects with so many stakeholders involved. And then not only doing that, but then also writing up this research um, and actually, you know, ex extending theory about this and then going back to these stakeholders and telling them what you found. And so I'm so impressed. I'm guessing that you must have like a clone or something, but any insight that you have into doing this kind of work that is so meaningful, has such impact um, and how you kind of balance that all with the demands of, you know, your job as a research oriented faculty member. That's a wonderful question. Um, and uh, first thing I would like to say is that this is not all just me, right? So um, really Kate and Sean and Rong and all the people I talked about up front um, were all a huge part of this team-based effort and were instrumental. Um, I was uh, on the phone with Kate and uh, Rong the other day about another paper, and I was saying you, they were kind of, you know, saying, well, you know, should we keep harping on the fact that this is such a large study? And I'm like, yes, do you remember how, like, you spent six months on the phone with people? <laughs> you should get credit for that, because that's true. That I mean, although we got 26 networks, we had over 100 networks say yes. We just couldn't match them, <laughs> right, with the right thing. We tried so hard to get a California network. We tried so hard to get a Washington network, but every time we would call somebody up and saying, you know, your community has been matched with this collective impact network somewhere from this other city. They're like, how did you know we formed a collective impact network too, just last month? And we'd be like, and they'd be back on the phone, right? So this is not just me. That's one thing is that having a really great team around you is, is fantastic. And this was a long project. Like this was three years, one year of recruiting, to be honest, and then a lot of data collection um, with a huge team of not only of, of just the folks you saw up there, but the thing, the like the gratitude section in this paper has, I kid you not, 40 undergraduate students um, who all were very instrumental in conducting interviews and cleaning data and um, being a part of that because all of those surveys we didn't roll that via qual out via Qualtrics we did phone call surveys for all of those organizations so that was like 500 and some phone call interview conversations and surveys and that was a ton of undergrads so um, it takes a huge team to do this kind of work it's not just me and I couldn't do it alone um, and I love working with students it's so much fun I wouldn't want to do this work any other way Thanks for that. Lots more to unpack there, I'm sure. Um, but let's hear what other questions anyone else has. Michelle, I have a question about the collective impact uh, piece of this and the fact that you were uh, very intentionally matching, right? Collective impact from that. Did I understand correctly that each of the red diamonds on uh, the figure you showed us represented a collective impact? network and none of them uh, the, were standouts? The, okay, so there's two answers to the question. One is in the figure that was over time. So that was different years of the same network in Iowa who happened um, to be the collective okay. impact network in that case. Okay. Um, so this is the place where I've irritated a lot of, of, of collective impact folks because on our advisory board for this project, we're the folks from Strive Together, we're the folks from that Aspen Institute, we're the folks from the Collective Impact Forum. Um, so they all like came, flew into DC, helped advise on this project. And at the end of the day, I had to tell them that none of the networks that were using their collective impact model were more effective. Yeah, then I wanted to else. confirm that I'd heard that correctly. You have, you did hear that correctly. And that they've tried several different ways to make that not true. Um, but 
in our estimation, being able to claim their five characteristics, their original five characteristics, and I'll give them credit, they've evolved since their original five, but their original five characteristics were not necessarily aligned with greater effectiveness as we measured it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and not super surprising, and you and I have talked extensively about this in years past, uh, but I do want to just point out then to be sure that I'm understanding that Voyage, one of the effective networks, um, although it had a backbone, was actually not categorized as collective impact because its backbone was facilitative, not directive. And because they didn't do any of the other stuff. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All yeah. Right. Um, so they, yeah, they didn't collect data. They didn't have top leadership at the table and did communis continuous communication. They were very much a grassroots effort. And so okay. when we talked to them, we asked if they were collective impact. They're like, no, we're not that. Okay. <laughs> we we're doing something else. Yeah. So one other just follow-up question to make sure I'm understanding the data here that I'm curious how you made a design choice, if I understand correctly, that your resource munificence measure had to do with the community uh, mm -hmm. economic development, so poverty degree only. Did you consider um, using any kind of, of network resource base, like grant funded or community funded, like paid coordinator, anything that would indicate anything about the resource level of the network itself? We we didn't consider that as a particular alternative. We did consider school district funding pretty seriously for a time period. Um, so looking at funding per pupil, but that didn't account for the fact that many of our networks were um, including out of school time providers and preschool providers. And um, some of them are doing more public health or family oriented kind of um, moves in terms of navigation and um, social services which wasn't accounted for that funding. So we, we did get pushback from a reviewer saying, why didn't you use school? When we did a couple rounds with a reviewer about that, why not using per, per people funding? Um, then one of the reasons why I think it's difficult to just use the coordination funding is because the learning theory of change and the systems alignment theory of change doesn't assume it's the joint products of the network that is the is actually the thing making the difference it's the organization's improvement in the quality of the services that they provide and their alignment that makes the difference so the resources are not just captured in the coordination of the network it also are captured inside of the organizations themselves yep i can see the conundrum there mm -hmm. very interesting okay who else has questions Anyone else? Um, oh, I would love to hear a little bit more about your theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. oh, that, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, okay, so big picture. There are two dominant theories about why networks at the network level are effective. Um, there's what's considered the processual view or process view and there's the configurational view. So these are two very different camps. Um, the processual view, which is not our view, but you should know what it is so I can kind of contrast it, um, primarily says that it is the series of negotiated choices that a network makes over time that ultimately determines its outcome. And so it's like um, things like, did in its early um, phase, did it spend enough time um, thinking and building trusting relationships among participants. That's the, it, were those processes in place? Um, did they um, fully unearth all of the different conflicts that were likely to occur between organizations? They look at things like that. Um, and it comes primarily, um, that view really started with um, the work of Barbara Gray who's a business school professor. She started out as a negotiation professor, so you can kind of guess kind of the way that this evolved, um, but has since been picked up by Jill Purdy, who's her student and others, um, and Amelia Clark, um, who all really look at this kind of processual model. Of in, it looks at stages or processes. Um, sometimes the stages are sequential, sometimes they're recursive, but they always look at stages. The configurational approach in contrast to that 
um, does not look at stages, but it looks at a combination of characteristics, both in the network design and in the environment that are associated with network effectiveness. Um, so the idea there is it's a very, uh, it's somewhat tied in some ways to the um, Boolean logic kind of, uh, kind of QCA approach. It's the most commonly used approach to study it. Um, so those things tend to go hand in hand, um, but they talk about um, really there's now five, if we include theory of change buckets of factors. One is like the external contextual factors, the most common one studied is resource munificence, and it's the most consistent finding we have. Resource munificence makes a difference. Um, the second one is structural characteristics, so governance, occasionally centralization, that's the kind of things that people look at. Um, rarely studied, but now also newly kind of put forward is management, so leadership attributes, conflict management, that kind of stuff could be a part of that configuration. There are a few people who want to add process to this, which kind of muddies the water with the processual view, but like we like to add the thing about con uh, this idea of configurational is we could add multiple things together and it's hard to know when it's going to stop. So process has recently got it added to trust and commitment. And the thing that we've been talking about is what we call joint project pr joint products. And that's really about the theory of change. Like for us, it's you can't just look at the context and how the network is set up internally. They have to produce something in order to make a social impact. What did they produce? And it might be a product, it might be a learning, it might be an alignment, but that's why we're after that as a, a fifth category. Um, that tradition um, dates back um, to at least 2004 five now um, coming out of it. And there are now at least two systematic literature reviews um, kind of covering the number of, of, of studies that compare, um, configure, take a configurational approach and look at network effectiveness in a lot of different ways. Thank you, that was super helpful. Any other questions? All right, we're not seeing any other hands and we're gonna thank Rochelle for her time, let her get on to her dinner and evening.